So uh, we're going to start with just a couple of um, background things. Um, the, if you have comments or questions, would you be ready at the end? I'm going to do my best to not use all the time this morning, but I do tend to get carried away when I'm talking about leadership. I do tend to get carried away a bit because it, it, I think I've said this to you enough that you know I don't have that many days left in ministry, and I want to make the most of all of them. And I want to leave behind me everything I possibly can in the lives of my brothers and sisters that I love here at Cedar Grove. And thankfully, these are being recorded so that they can be used with the people I love on the other side of the world in Bible colleges and Bible classes. So um, if you are a leader on the other side of the world, when you get this uh, lesson, it is yours. It is free. You may give it to anyone you wish. You may put your name on it. Steal boldly. This is not plagiarism when the author says, Please use this for your ministry. Everybody good? Here in the room and on the other side of the world, uh, those of you who will see this on, on the internet. So here we go. Leading from a foundation of integrity. I want to begin with our overarching scripture on what I believe leaders are called to do. Uh, this isn't academic for me. I've been doing this since 1986, looking for leaders and empowering them. And there are lots of people in this room who have no clue what 1986 looked like. Uh, it's all good. But I've been empowering leaders in the churches that I pastor since 1986. And if you would ever talk to people like Ron and Juanita Mast, Alan Jeannie Ream, Dean and Barb Willow, people like that who were here 150 years ago, when I pastored here the first time, they would tell you, I also, when I was your youth pastor, looked for people that I could empower leadership as well. So I'm doing this a long time. And here's why. The Bible says present leaders should invest in future leaders. Let's read together. You ready? Let's read. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And I want to just add men and women, because I believe women are leaders too. I don't believe women are subservient leaders because of their gender. And I'm presently working on an eight and a half page document about that. Um, that I was concerned about. So I wrote a paper on it, and our denomination is looking forward to getting it. Um, the next generation of spiritual leaders will not arise from good intentions or because they're in a Bible-based church. They won't arise from um, hoping that somebody will get called the the next generation of missionaries, pastors, teachers, godly leaders are children now in churches. Somebody just fell down the steps. <laughs> or maybe Lyman ran down the steps. I mean, he, he's, he's been known to do that. Um, so you're getting what I'm trying to say here, right? That investment is everything. So present day leaders are called to invest in the, in the next generation of leaders. And we'll come back to this as we go along this morning. Our thesis today, the Lord has called spiritual leaders in the body here at Cedar Grove and you on the other side of the world. And we are called primarily to be with Jesus. That's our first responsibility. Be with Jesus. Know his presence. Know his power. That's our first responsibility. If we know him, if we're in his presence and we're experiencing his power, he's going to put people in our hearts that we can invest in. He just is. 
Those of you who are, who are watching what's happening here at Cedar Grove right now, you will know that I am thrilled. I wasn't happy about it at the beginning, but I'm thrilled that Ramon and Evelyn, my friends, your marriage is okay, right? You're not sitting with each other. I'm, I'm worried. <laughs> <laughs> Ramon and Evelyn are, are the, pastoring now in the Spanish church at Cedar Grove, and I'm so thrilled for you. I wasn't happy that you left us, but I'm happy that you're following the call of God. You'll, those of you will recognize, who are here in the room will recognize, I am presently empowering Garrick, Amber, and, and Annette. I'm presently trying to empower them as leaders. So th this isn't something that's academic for me. It's something I'm trying to do constantly. Let's read what Jesus said. Here we go. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him. Em emphasis intentional. You got that. Those are incredibly Six incredibly important words. Leaders in the body of Christ. That they might be with him. He called them not to do stuff first. Amen? Good? Let's read. And that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Where does the preaching and the authority come from? Being with Jesus. Are we good? I know, this sounds like ABCs of spiritual life, but it's not. When, when things are tough, you have to have more in you than what your humanity brings to the table. And I promise you, if you're a spiritual leader or become a spiritual leader, the enemy is going to try to take you out. That they might be with him. Cannot overstate the importance of those words. We're called to be men and women who choose to live under spiritual authority. You don't have spiritual authority unless you're under authority. Authority doesn't come from the humanity. I don't have authority because I have an ordination from the Brethren in Christ Church. I have authority because the Lord Jesus Christ put his spirit in me and called me to preach the gospel for the last 44 years. Authority happens first when we are under authority. Then it becomes authority that we may impart in the lives of other people. One of the clear requirements of men and women who would lead in the body of Christ is that we be people of integrity. Today's message on leadership is about integrity. There's an axiom. Leadership is influence. And that is absolutely true. Leadership is influence. There is no influence where there is no integrity. You, you see my walk with Raina. You see my walk with Gary, Amber, Al, Annette, and Nicole. You see my walk with the church leaders, deacons. We have the best deacons in the world, by the way. Just want you to know. We have the very, very best deacons in the whole world. And that is hyperbole, and I meant to use it. <laughs> because they are awesome. But you see that. You, you know how we live. You, you can't overstate this. If there's no integrity, there's no authority. And the life will implode. It just absolutely will implode. I was down at the uh, Pastor's PK, Pastor's Promise Keepers. This is at least 100 years ago in Atlanta. Um, I don't think it even exists anymore. I think it's called the Georgia Dome. I don't think it even exists any, anymore. I think they blew it up probably because a bunch of preachers went in there and worshipped for a few days. But anyway, Max Lucado said this. 
Integrity is what you are when no one is looking. We don't believe in this, but holy cow. <laughs> That's in India. Integrity is what you are when no one is looking. Brothers and sisters, here and on the other side of the world, that is critical. What a word to people who are called to be leaders in the family of God. Um, my favorite definition of integrity is the nautical definition. The nautical definition says, a ship is said to have integrity when it can remain afloat when it passes through storms. I love that definition. And it's not just because I was on the USS Kitty Hawk for a year and a half of my life, the aircraft carrier, and I was glad it had integrity, <laughs> or I'd be dead. Uh, but it's because it's such a powerful word to, to you and me as vessels. We're called to be vessels that remain afloat when life flies craziness up your nose. You've heard me use the illustration often that there are going to be people who are going to back up their spiritual manure spreader up to your chest and your face, and they're going to throw on the blades. And you have to be able to remain afloat when life is tearing you apart. Spiritual leadership isn't easy. It's difficult. Life isn't easy. We all face adversity. You heard me say at the beginning today, uh, it's a very, very difficult time in my home. I have to have more in my life than what I bring to the table. I just do. If you have cared for an aging parent, you know what I'm talking about. If you've cared for a difficult aging parent, you know what I'm talking about. It's not easy. So anyway, come on, Ken. For all of us in this room right now, <clears throat> we can't just think about ourselves only, right? Life isn't easy. Everyone faces adversity. Things are going to get stormy. You can't just think about yourself. If you're a leader, you are responsible to think about how you are affecting the lives of other people. That has to be paramount. And here's why. The corporate body life mentality that we as leaders bring to the table. We are more important than me. I know that's an axiom you've heard many times. But we are more important than we. Folks, there are leaders here that, do, that say and do things that I wouldn't say and do. But I refuse. I refuse to let that harm my view of them and their leadership. When I can, I will speak directly into that life to correct. When I think it's not that big a deal, I won't. Because we are more important than me. Corporate life, you have to think corporate body life if you're a leader in the kingdom. When groups of people go through adversity, and we do, COVID-19, RRR, when you go through times of adversity, people of integrity model loving God and are motivated to please God. When the church is in pain and heartache, we model loving God and we are motivated to please God and we do our very, very best to get everybody's eyes fixed on Jesus, not the CDC, Dr. Fauci, and certainly not some president. And I meant that for all of the last four, not just this one. I do not serve a donkey or an elephant. I serve a lamb. You might be doing it. Ah, there it is. Spiritual leaders who can face hardship and remain afloat are people who are faith-filled. 
Their attitudes are faith spurred. Spiritual leaders who connect meaningfully with Jesus experience his heart. When, when uh, Carolyn, was it you who said my friend has inoperable cancer in his face? Is that right? Didn't, did that make your heart thud for that poor person? The, the compassion of Jesus, it, it just, it moves you. When you're spending time with him, you're going to see how he feels about people. What, how, how they matter to him. Faith-filled leaders experience compassion, grace, mercy, strength, and they lavishly share it with their brothers and sisters because it's not theirs. What, what Jesus gives me is never mine. When I'm preparing a message for you all for a Sunday morning, it's never mine. It's for you. Faith-filled leaders are constantly looking to that effect. Now, I have two extremely important principles we're going to start with, and then we're going to look at four areas as quickly as I possibly can. Uh, we're going to look at four areas of, of what, what's really, really important about integrity. So here's the first principle. Spiritual authority is only authentic when its foundation is a living and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. What we're called to give, what we're called to impart to the lives of people, is the life of Jesus. There's an incredible quote I want to give you. Before I give you the quote, spiritual leadership, spiritual authority to lead in his kingdom, never originates in you and me, ever. It originates in his call, his anointing, always, always, always. If you're a person of spiritual authority, it's because the Lord has something for you to do. Perhaps it's to work with youth. Perhaps it's to work with children. Perhaps it's to lead a home group. Authority to help others doesn't originate with you. It originates in heaven in the very heart of God. I cannot, cannot overstate that. Here's the quote. Well, Mike Bickle, uh, in the book Passion for Jesus, wrote the following quote. Um, and by the way, I'll just tell you, he is a charismatic pastor in Kansas. If you have a problem with that, get over it. <laughs> Listen to this amazing quote. Ministry at its most basic definition is the manifestation of the knowledge of God in my life. My most vital ministry is revealing the beauty and splendor of Jesus to others. <laughs> wow. You want to hear that again? Three of you are nodding, so I'll, I'll help you three out. <laughs> ministry at its most basic definition is the manifestation of the knowledge of Jesus through my life. My most vital ministry is revealing the beauty and splendor of Jesus to others. End quote. Wow. That'll float, won't it? Wow. Great, great stuff. In Matthew 9, 35 to 10, 1, and I'm just going to tell you where I got this, uh, where I got this insight. I didn't have this insight until I met a man named John Maxwell. And I'm not going to name drop or anything, but I watched the Super Bowl in his living room. <laughs> so he gave us this. He gave us this statement that really grabbed me. He said, "Jesus didn't give authority." Unto, uh, to his disciples to go and preach and teach until they walked with him and saw him see, feel, call, and send. Oh. And the next thing he did was he gave me the authority to lead and sent them out. And 
Then, it says there, then and only then did he give them his authority to share the word. Do you remember the story in Matthew? Matthew 9 and 10? Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Jesus saw the needs. Jesus felt compassion. Jesus called them to pray for the Lord to send out harvesters into the harvest field. And then and only then did he send them out with authority to preach. Really, really important, important stuff. So here we go. I told you we were going to do four areas of integrity. Um, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't give you spiritual principle number two yet. Slow down, Ken. Slow down. <laughs> principle number two. We are often anointed to do ministry out of the very places where the Lord has permitted the enemy to tear us apart. Why do you think that is? That's a great question, isn't it? I'll tell you why I think it is. I think the places where we've been hurt the deepest, we've been healed the most. <laughs> Amen? Is that, is that resonating with your heart? The places where we hurt the most, we experience the loving mercy and the healing of Jesus the most. I just love this following statement here. The places of the heart where I have been cut the deepest are almost always family. I've been lied about. I've been slandered. I've been... I, I have the great joy of splitting a church <laughs> over whether or not it would be a community church. And if you've never experienced anything like that, it's just barrels of monkeys. It's just so much fun. <laughs> now, that, now, that church today, I might say, has daughtered three daughter churches and has about five or 600 people in it and is led by a personal friend of mine whom I train, Dr. Lane Levo. He's my brother and my friend. And he was a junior in high school when I became his pastor. Garrett, what were you when I got here? You were in college, weren't you? Yeah. Pretty close. Pretty close proximity. Yeah. In case you're wondering, I, I love that man back there. And I think God has great things in store for him. Um, what, what I'm trying to show you here is the healing of Jesus brings a resource or a provision into our life that we would not otherwise have. And some of you younger ones in the room, this will mean more to you when you've lived a few more years, like the old guy in front of you. This will mean more to you later, but I hope you still have these notes on yourself and you can say, wait a minute, I'm walking through hardship. That crazy old guy with the white hair said, Jesus wants to heal me when I'm walking in hardship. Maybe I should read those notes. Okay, yeah. Enough of the commercial, Kenneth. <laughs> this is one of my favorite missionary quotes in the whole world. I put it up there. I don't know if it's in your notes or not. I'm sorry. Is it in your notes, Amy Carmichael? It is! Wow! I was on it that day. Wonderful. So we can read this together? Let's do it. Just the, just the quote from Amy Carmichael. It ends with the question mark. You ready? Can he have followed far who has no scar? That is my favorite. She was a missionary to India. And that is my absolute favorite quote I've ever read by a missionary. No offense, Mike. <laughs> Mike Holland's one of my favorite missionaries in the whole world. He's easy, easily in my top 100. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's what I want you to see. If you have scars, that means you were healed. If you have wounds and offenses, it means you're not. I'm just going to wait for all the little balms to go off in the room. So if you're sitting here holding grudges or nursing resentment, you don't have scars. You have wounds. 
Boy, I just can't overstate this one. That is vital, vital, vital for you guys to understand, guys and gals. Life is short. Don't spend time nursing grudges and fueling resentment. Don't invest time in that. It only tears you apart. Does absolutely nothing for the offense that was done to you. Take the offense to Jesus at the cross and get a scar where the wound is. My cousin, brother, and friend, Doug Miser, um, I've missed Doug terribly. Um, but my friend, cousin, and brother, Doug Miser, helped me to get that huge scar on my right arm. Um, he shoved me through a French door <laughs> at my grandma Hefner's house, and when I came up, there was a glass shard hanging out of my elbow, and one of my cousins pulled it out, and the, <laughs> the blood started squirting across the room. My Aunt Fern was there, who was an RN. She put a tourniquet on it, they sent me to McAllisterville to Dr. Yoder, and he sewed that sucker up without Novocaine. <laughs> Four women held me down. I've never forgiven women to this day. I don't like any of you, except Raina. Now, to get even with Doug, to be fair, I shot him. <laughs> This is so good. I, I am going somewhere with this nut, nuttiness. I just thought you needed to laugh. Um, we were cleaning up garbage at our home on, on Fairview Road in McAllisterville, and Doug was on a loader, and I was standing on the barn wall with my 20 gauge shotgun with blow brass in it because I knew there was a copperhead out there, and I wanted to get him. Well, I saw him. Doug was moving the trash. And I saw him. And I pulled up and clicked the safe off. And Doug yells, no! <laughs> Bang! Bullet. BB. Right here. Flat BB. Went right into his lip. And I had to dig it out with a pair of tweezers and put, put antiseptic on it. And we looked at one another and said, okay, we're even. <laughs> it took me, it took me what, 31 years to get even one, but I shot him. So. Doug, I hope you're watching over the corridors of heaven and you're enjoying your time with your family up there, but we miss you here. Did you get the copperhead? I did. Took his head right off. Took his head right off. I'm, I'm one of those guys that doesn't miss when he shoots, so. I grew up country boy. Yeah. I can shoot. And by the way, I taught my grandson to shoot, and he just became a marksman in military police boot camp. So. He got decorated by the lieutenant colonel, so I'm not proud or anything. Um, <laughs> his name's Jared, Jared Hefner, and pray for him. He's a wonderful young man that I dearly, dearly love. And anyway. Um, the guy I want to talk about with integrity is this guy, Joseph, and I'm going to try to go quickly here, but it, it, it really bears, it, it bears telling what he went through. Because if you want to see a life of integrity, you need to look at Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. He was sold into a man's house. He was lusted after by the man's wife. He was falsely accused and thrown in prison. He spent two years in prison for something he didn't do. Years have gone by. And now his brothers show up. And how does he treat them? Kindness. Chad was exactly right. He was merciful. How could he do that? Because he got God's grace. And God's mercy for his brothers. Amen? You all good? He had a scar, not a wound. See this? That's my Doug Miser and Richie Hefner scar. 
but it doesn't hurt anymore. It's just a scar. I remember, but it doesn't hurt anymore. Are you getting the metaphor? I mean, is this landing? You want scars, not wounds. Okay, we're going to get rolling. Ken, you have really, really wasted too much time telling all these stories. Uh, how did I get all the way back there? I had no idea what I did. I'm sorry. Am I going the wrong way? Yeah. I'm, oh, my word. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was pushing the wrong buttons. Okay, here's the first one. And I know some of you in the room are too young to be married. Bear with me. Okay? I get it. I get it. And I'm so thankful you're here, by the way. Thank you, Derek, for bringing them in, and Missy for bringing them in. Without question, the first place that you look for in a relationship is in the marriage and the family of that spiritual leader. And we're going to read together because it's really important that we know what Scripture says about this. Let's read it. Now, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Titus doesn't give us any breaks. He writes, Paul writes, let's read. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, a man whose children are, believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered. So, Paul told these young pastors, look to the marriage and the family of the potential leader to see how they wear in their home. And you're sitting here thinking, okay, I'm in high school, and my little brother or my little sister bugged me to no end. Or my older brother or my older sister are just too bossy. Look, the first place God tones you is in your family. And that's what this is saying. He, he hones us and sharpens us and rubs off our rough edges in our marriages, in our parenting, in our being kids together. I had two great sisters, but... I didn't like them all that much growing up. I love them now. You with me? You good? Okay, then. Um, if a person cannot develop relationships with a spouse, and I know some of you in this room are single, and some of you are single not by your own choice, and I'm sorry about that. But marriage and family were created by God as the place where a man and a woman would grow and mature and create a family. It, 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 it's created in our childhood, in our home. It shapes our character, shapes our nature in our childhood, in our home. And I'm aware some of you in the room today are walking out of a, a situation of wounding where you tried and tried and tried and it didn't work. I'm not trying to put any false guilt on you at all. Please don't hear that. Please don't take any false guilt from that. I'm just saying the first place that we're honed is in our home. And it's very, very important that we understand that. So significant relationships. I've been doing this. This is my 44th year of pastoral ministry. And significant relationships that are rejected are often filled up with Christian activity. Should I play the Jeopardy music? <laughs> While you think about that. La, 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 la. What am I saying? If you, if you have a person who isn't wearing well in their family, they may want to do a lot of things around the church to get out of their family. 
and appear spiritual. That's a lot of honesty for a Sunday morning. Ben. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're following the logic? I've been doing this for 44 years. And if, if a person lacks the people skills in their home, generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, they will implode in church. Just trying to help you. Pastor Ted, and I have a question. Go ahead. I live in Service Church in Troy, and there's a lady over there. I want to know, because I'm 85 and I can't get a swing away. She goes off the rocker. You know what I mean. She gets off her rocker, okay. And she says she can't do nothing with it, but if you tell her head to get her back from where she was, mind-wise, yeah. is that a sin? Um, I'll, I'll answer that this way. If you have a person in your life who has Alzheimer's disease or dementia, don't keep telling them their spouse died because they'll relive the grief every time. I tell her mom or dad and the kids don't turn their weight and Exactly. And don't died. tell them they died because they'll relive the grief every time you tell them. Yeah. So it's merciful to not tell them the whole truth. Does that help, Richard? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That again comes out of the school of hard knocks. That's not written anywhere in a manual that I'm aware of. Okay. So. Here's a hint. Here's, here's a hint for you, leaders here and leaders on the other side of the world. Do you want to know how a family feels about the member of the family? Watch their face when they're telling people how good their walk with God is. Watch their family's faces. Should we get the violins out? You're, you're hearing this, right? If the kids are listening, if a parent is talking about how great their spiritual life is, and the kids are glaring at the floor, in the words of that great astronaut Tom Hanks, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you. I'm just trying to help you. Integrity with the next generation of Christian leaders. It's coming up on 10 o'clock. Ken, you got to get moving. We're going to read together. This is a wonderful, wonderful scripture. Let's read. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others. Now, you're going to recognize right away, we already read that today, but it's important here. It's really important here. Here's why. Jesus says this in Matthew 10, 7 to 8. The Lord Jesus is talking about imparting and investing. Let's read. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You have received without paying. Give without pay. Really, really important. Here's what, here's what we need to see about investing. I, I chose very, very early on in my life in ministry to invest. Um, I was in a situation where I was just starting out in ministry, and everything I did, everything I did, my senior pastor was there. Didn't matter what I did, he was there. And it made me feel like I might, I might not be doing this right. Because I was, I, was here, I was in that role six and a half years, and the senior pastor was in every meeting I held. And I'm thinking. So when I became senior pastor at Mechanicsburg, that was one of the first things I decided I wasn't going to do. I was not going to show up at every meeting one of my associates had. I was not going to be at every youth meeting. When we did four building programs at, at, at McVic, and by the way, Building programs are a hoot for pastors. When we did four, when we did four building programs at, at McVick, 
I didn't even steal on the building committee. I never showed up to a single building committee. Why? Because it's their building, not mine. I have nothing to do with it today. They do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Investment is a choice. You choose to invest in people. You choose to give away leadership. You choose the principle of investment as opposed to spending your life. You can spend your life. You can spend your life making money. You can spend your life getting things. You can spend your life advancing your career. Or you can invest in the lives of people. And that's the choice I made almost 37 years ago. I made the choice. I'm going to invest in people. And Garrick will tell you, he might not tell you, he might want to get even with me for all the times I've told him up. He'll tell you, when he's doing a ministry, I'm not there. Because I trust him. And I think he's a wonderful young man. Are we good? Okay then. As long as we're good. We, we are called as spiritual leaders today to give away what we've been entrusted with to others. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, this next line, as soon as you're finished writing those words, we're, we're called to give away what we've been entrusted with to others. I can't overemphasize the importance of this slide. Show me a leader who is intent on keeping his or her position, and I will show you a person who does not fully understand the ethos of the kingdom of God. You cannot, you cannot want to keep your job. You just can't. My dream for Cedar Grove Brethren in Christ Church is that the young people who come behind me will be way better than I was. Way better. And that's my cry. That's my heart cry before God. I want the people who replace me here to be way better than I was. It's not going to take that much. You're getting the point. Here's a principle about investment. You cannot overstate the importance of this one as well. You only have what you have with the power. You only possess what you have with the power to give it away. The only authority you have, truly have, is authority you have to give it to someone else. And I cannot overstate that one either. The next generation of leaders will not arise from good intentions. The next generation of spiritual leaders will not arise from good churches with good preaching and teaching. The next generation of men and women who will lead in the family of God, I said this earlier, the next missionaries, Sunday school teachers, pastors, leaders are in churches right now as children and youth, and they must experience personal investment. I had people who invested in me tremendously. My first investor was my uncle Sam Hefner. We named a son after him. Pastor Sam down in Dillsburg. My second investor was a man named Ken Beeson. Phil and Gloria might be the only people in the room who knew Ken Beeson. You did? Gary? Of course, Gary did. Sorry. Rena, Rena did. There are a lot of you who knew Ken Beeson. Sorry. Um, my next investor was Pastor Eugene Hydra. He invested in me tremendously. I was three years from drugs and alcohol when the Spirit of God called me to preach and Pastor Heidler knew it. Now just think about that one for a minute. Three years from drugs and alcohol and Pastor Heidler made me youth pastor here. He took a lot of heat for that one. You might not know this name, but Mary Beth Stoner lost her mind on Pastor Gene <laughs> because he was making me a pastor. <laughs> she said, he's too young, he's too inexperienced. He was a mess before. Well, <laughs> we were riding together in a car one day. I, I, I'm telling you why I know this. We were riding together in a car one day going to a seminar of psychology. She was beside me in the seat. 
And she said, okay, I need to tell you something. I said, okay, Mary Beth, what's that? She said, I thought you were going to be a terrible pastor. <laughs> and she said, but I could not have been more wrong. And I'm happy to be wrong. She said, you have my full support. How does that feel, right? How does that feel? The next generation of spiritual leaders, um, they're going to arise when there are people who are presently spiritual leaders who understand and care more about the kingdom than they care about keeping their position. So the next generation of spiritual leaders are going to be arising because the present generation of spiritual leaders are concerned about their footprint. I'm concerned about the footprint I'm leaving here and in my pastor friends on the other side of the world, the footprint issue. I'm going to go a little quicker now because we're running out of time. I told you too many stories and said too many funny things this morning. <laughs> Occupational hazard. We must be willing to answer, ask and answer well this question. What am I presently doing that will outlive me? You have to be able to answer that question well. What am I presently doing that will outlive me? We must have spiritual leaders who are ready and willing to invest in a new generation of spiritual leaders in, in just in real time, I'm just going to say this, it is way easier to take someone, to put someone into leadership than it is to take them out of leadership. So the best thing to do is take time and be prayerful on the front end. Take time and be prayerful on the front end. Before Jesus called his disciples, he invested incredible time with them in three areas. One, he invested in them in the area of integrity. So when I'm looking for spiritual leaders in the body of Christ here, that's the first thing I look for. Do we see the seeds of integrity? I didn't say they've got it all together. I said, do we see the seeds of integrity? Second, do we see the seeds of honesty? Are they essentially honest? And then third, are they developing in personal holiness? I mean, Pastor Heiser took an enormous risk on this whippersnapper when I was 25. He took an enormous risk with me. But he saw things in me that other people didn't see. Mary Beth Turner. So, <laughs> integrity with the local body of believers. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read these because we're running out of time. Uh, but 1 Timothy 3.6, Titus 1.9... It's essentially how we wear with the local body of believers. Regarding deacons, I love this about deacons, and we have 24 of the best deacons in the history of the world. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's anything against them, let them serve as a Were they tested? In their local church. Right? In their local church. This isn't rocket science. So, when we're talking about this issue, we're talking about looking at how well a person wears. I'm, I'm running out of time, but oh, I just have to tell you one more quick story. Is that all right? One more quick story. Um, in Mechanicsburg, we had this um, sister in Christ who came to worship with us. And when she came in, she walked right over to me, got right in my face, personal space. I, I'm thinking she needs a breath mint. Personal space, right in my face. And she said, Pastor, I have been a leader in every church I've been in. I look forward to leading with you. <laughs> Turned around on her heels and walked away. Six months later, we had another conversation. This time, her face was bright red. And she was still in my face. Space. Too much personal space. Wasn't enough personal space for me. She's yelling at me. I've been here six months and I'm not a leader yet. And I said, would you like to know why? She said, yes. I'm going to tell you why. Because I never saw you once bend down to pick up a piece of paper you walked past. I never saw you once comfort a crying child that was lost by their parent. I watched you. I never saw you once serve in any way 
And in the kingdom, we serve it before we leave. She said, I'll never be back again. My temptation was to say, don't let the door hit you in the caboose on the way out. <laughs> but I held my peace and said, may you be blessed where you go next. Are you hearing me? How do they wear? How do they wear? Really cr crucial stuff. Okay, I got to move. Um, the local body is a training and testing ground. Again, cannot overstate that one. It, it is a taint training and testing ground. Um, you, you have to encourage people into ministry responsibilities, and then you look for the fruit that they leave behind them in other people. You watch them in the ministry, and you watch what's happening behind them. That's how you know you have a leader on your hands. You want those people who have the fruit thing going. Right, Richard? <laughs> okay. Um, the local church is the place where ministry calling, the future in ministry is right now here at Cedar Grove. Many of them are sitting in this room, and they're really, really young. The next generation of Christian leaders is presently alive and living in our local churches. They must be <clears throat> identified, and they must be deployed. <clears throat> They must be identified and they must be aboard, deployed. The fourth and final area, integrity with the pre-Christian and unchurched world. First Timothy 3, 7, you must also have a good reputation with outsiders. Now, there are two foci that I just want to brush through quickly about this reputation with outsiders, the integrity issue when it comes to how we interact with people who are not saved. Are you with me? Two, two foci. One. We must have a solid reputation of how we do business. How you pay your taxes. How you show up for work. Do you leave 10, in, ten minutes early and say you stayed those 10 minutes? Are you on your phone during business hours? Are you shopping when you're at your computer at work in your cubicle? You know, when you're on the internet shopping, your boss can look at your history. <clears throat> Everything you do, Big Brother is watching. I'm only telling you this because I care deeply about the kingdom and the future. Another way to look at reputation with outsiders is not be, it gets beyond the personal investment issue. Another way to look at this issue of reputation with outsiders is how much do you love and care about people who are lost? Who are, who are saying things to you that make your blood boil? How do you feel about them in your heart? Do you hate them? Or do you love them and care about the fact that they're on their way to hell? And you can pray something different happens to them. I, I'm convinced the more you spend time with Jesus, the more you and I spend time with Jesus, the more his heart for lost people will come through us. The heart of God must become our heart. Amen? The heart of God must become our heart. You must have the heart of God if you're going to lead well in the family of God. And I know it's 10.15, I didn't give time for comments, I'm sorry about that, but here's, here's a scripture that, in my opinion, is the greatest word that Jesus ever said about how he felt about sinners. It's right there, let's read it. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. I told you, when Jesus found me, I was a train wreck. I got saved in a limestone quarry as a 22-year-old, almost 23-year-old, and I was a drug-using, dope-smoking, beer-guzzling train wreck. But Jesus found me, and two and a half years later, he started to call me to preach. Now, you, can you imagine my sweetness 
My sweetness in my life reigneth. Can you imagine how, how much of a steep learning curve it was for that dear little woman to go from drug and alcohol abuser's wife to Pastor Penn's wife in two and a half years? Huh? She did it. And I couldn't be more grateful for her. Thank you for the opportunity to speak into your life. Thank you for those of you who are tuning into this on the other side of the world. Again, you are free to use this as much as you want. I love you. I want you to prosper. And the same goes for you in this room. I love you. I want your spiritual life to prosper. And I'm looking at some of the next generation of Christian leaders here, and some of them are junior high. I'm looking at you. And I'm seeing you. And I think you're awesome. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy communion.